Hello, my name is Helen Berry and I'm a professor of history at the University of Exeter. I'm the author of Orphans of Empire, The Fate of London's Foundlings, and I'm also the external curator for this amazing exhibition here at the Foundling Museum called Fighting Talk. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about some of the highlights of the exhibition now. So the starting point for the exhibition is this incredible document, which was written by a former foundling called George King. Now, George's diary has been sitting here in the Foundling Museum for many years. And a good few years ago now, I was researching the history of what happened to the foundlings who had been brought up in the hospital during the 18th century. And I was looking for a story written by a foundling who was born at that time. But finding that kind of material is incredibly hard because most times people didn't leave a written record of their lives. But here we have it, the only surviving first-hand account uh, written by someone raised in the Foundling Hospital who was born in the 1700s. So this is the original copy of George King's diary and it forms the centrepiece of this exhibition about his life. So the incredible thing about this diary, which George wrote uh, when he was in his 50s, is that it goes back right to his earliest memories of when he was a child and he was being brought up by his foster mother, who was employed by the Findling Hospital to be his wet nurse. So he was raised in a happy family and then it charts the history of his life and adventures, including over 20 years at sea as a young man press gangs into the Royal Navy. It contains one of the few eyewitness, eyewitness accounts that we have of the Battle of Trafalgar written by an ordinary sailor. So there's many reasons why this is an absolutely extraordinary document and it contains so much rich detail about ordinary people's lives in the 18th and 19th centuries. So the amazing thing is that in this exhibition, all of the material relating to George's life has been brought together in one room. And it's possible to trace his story right from his first admission to the hospital as a baby through to when he was returned to be raised and schooled at the age of five in the institution in London, having been sent out to the countryside to be wet nursed by uh, his, the woman he called his mother. So this is an incredibly touching story right from the start, because at the age of five, he was separated from her and he would have been put into a uniform that looked very much like this one uh, and would have lived alongside other foundlings, dining together, eating a kind of food that was uh, a good diet for a poor boy uh, who had come from absolutely nothing and raised with a degree of care and education that was perhaps surprising for the times, including learning how to write as well as read. And that was to prove absolutely critical for the very first time and for the rest of his life. So unlike so many thousands of other children who tragically died while they were in the care of the Foundling Hospital, George survived to the age of 13, which was old enough to be sent out as an apprentice he was sent to work uh, in the city of London to a confectioner called John Brown, which was like winning the lottery for a young lad of his age. He had access to an amazing workshop that was full of sweets and treats. And he worked alongside other apprentices, learning a trade which would have been for seven years had it lasted right through to the end. But it wasn't to be for George. He obviously didn't settle in amongst this community of other boys and young men learning this trade. Although he spent some happy times there for a few years, he soon got into a fight with one of them, which was to prove a turning point for the rest of his life. He threw a pan of scalding sugar over a boy who had teased him, perhaps for being a foundling. And he was afraid that he was actually going to be imprisoned for his bad conduct. So one night he picked up his belongings and he fled. 
and he ran away from the care of his master, which was a very serious thing to do in those days, and he decided he was going to try his luck and run away to sea. So as a runaway apprentice, George decided to walk from central London all the way out to Chatham. And he didn't really know what was going to happen to him, but he pawned all of his belongings and he got himself some sailor's slops, which would have been the kinds of garments that were worn by the ordinary seamen of the day, much like this amazing pair of authentic, original sailor's trousers. We have them here in the exhibition. You can come and see them. Uh, they're an absolutely remarkable survival. I suspect they've never been worn. Uh, so they weren't ever worn by someone of George's uh, age and his uh, time. But he was setting out full of hope um, that he might forge himself a new and exciting life as a sailor. And when he got to Chatham, he fell in with a press gang and was soon on board HMS Polyphemus, bound for the Mediterranean. One of the incredible things that you can see in the exhibition is this remarkable object. This is something that George King would have actually touched probably every day when he was on board HMS Polyphemus. It's the figurehead, the original figurehead from the ship and uh, it depicts Polyphemus, the Cyclops, the one-eyed monster, and he uh, would have stood guard over HMS Polyphemus, and George would have recognised him every single day of his life as a sailor on board. Polyphemus was to play uh, a crucial role in the massing of the British fleet in preparation for one of the great iconic battles of British history at Trafalgar on the 21st of October, 1805. And George was there, he fought alongside the other men, and he left a unique eyewitness account in his own words of his experiences that day. We know how the Battle of Trafalgar ends, that the British fleet was victorious over the combined forces of the French and Spanish Navy. We also know that the commander, Admiral Lord Nelson, met his end that day. We have in the exhibition an actual fragment of the Union Jack that was used to drape Nelson's coffin at his funeral. And another incredible uh, link with George King himself is our inclusion of a pistol from that time period. Now, George tells in his diary, and later when he writes up his notes, he says that although he survived the trials of the ferocious battle that day, he nearly met his end. It was very unusual for ordinary sailors to be issued with pistols, partly because the fear was that they might mutiny. But the men that night on board the Polyphemus were both, were all issued with two pistols. And that was in case the French prisoners of war managed to break out on board in the night. So George says how he turned in and just as he was going to bed, exhausted from everything that, that had happened that day, he tucked his pistols under his arms and one of them accidentally went off. So he very nearly ended his own life on the very day of the Battle of Trafalgar. Fortunately for us, that didn't happen. And he then goes on to tell the story of the rest of his life at sea. This exhibition doesn't shy away dealing with some of the hard realities of being an ordinary sailor during George King's day. It was a gruelling world in which life and death were all around you. So George had this incredible sense of humour. He could tell a story and have a joke. It's clear from his diary that he got hold of rum as often as he could and he enjoyed a glass of grog. Uh, he loved fishing for mackerel and he enjoyed singing songs, and they even had theatre performances on board ship. So we capture some of that in the exhibition with some of the objects that are on display here. Also, some of the things which indicate the really hard discipline that the Royal Navy meted out to sailors, particularly if you were caught drunk on your watch. So we have the famous Cat of Nine Tails, and George describes how he received a lashing for being drunk on duty one day. So there is something here about how disturbing it is to think about some of the things 
that ordinary sailors would have seen and experienced, not just in periods of battle and war, but in their everyday lives uh, where they could fall off rigging and uh, injure themselves at any point. George, like many of his contemporaries, lived for the moment and the realities of living in a world with no antibiotics and no modern medicine are brought home and made clear in very vivid detail in his diary. George himself received many medical treatments uh, during his long sea service, including this kind of medicine, which was actually a poison containing mercury, which was a treatment for dysentery at the time. So this was not an easy world, this was not an easy life, and it was remarkable that he lived long enough to claim his pension. In his account of his life, George tells a story of how he crisscrossed the oceans, firstly as an ordinary sailor in the Royal Navy, and then as a merchant seaman. This was an era of unprecedented imperial expansion, and the British Navy was instrumental in enabling trade routes to be set up that built prosperity and wealth for Britain on the back of trade in both cargoes and indeed human cargo. The slave trade was abolished in Britain in 1807, but many of the trade networks that have been built up at this time relied continuously on the transatlantic trade to and from the Americas. George saw this for himself, so he ended up on a journey which took him all the way to Charleston in South Carolina. And through the medium of a video, the exhibition tells the story of what George saw in South Carolina as uh, someone eyewitness to a society which for white people prospered from slave labor. George became a schoolmaster in South Carolina and he saw for himself and experienced a better standard of living than he would have done in Britain, where he was at the bottom of the social pile. George's story there takes an interesting and in many ways disturbing turn. And you might like to come and see for yourself in the exhibition some of the materials that we've gathered about this troubling episode in his narrative. So after 24 years of hard service at sea, George is entitled to claim his pension of 16 pounds a year, but he needs to find a way to live. This is a time in the 1830s when there are a lot of demob soldiers and sailors coming back from the Napoleonic Wars and in that generation looking for work. And as someone not in the best of health, and now at the ripe old age of uh, his late 40s, he's moving towards being an old man, and things aren't looking good for him. And he talks about wandering around in the countryside and on the docks looking for work. He even fears that he might starve. But then, in a way that parallels his admission by lottery to the foundling hospital as a baby, he decides to enter another lottery to see if he can enter Greenwich Hospital for Old Sailors. And this was a hospital that was set up uh, in this period to look after veterans like him. But there was much more demand for places than there were places available. So one day he describes turning up and presenting his credentials to show that he was eligible for admission. And he was one of just a handful of men admitted that day while many other hundreds were turned away. So on the twists and turns of fate, George's life was hanging in the balance, but now his old age is going to prove to be much more secure. And he was admitted to Greenwich Hospital and given a fine suit of clothing that would have looked very much like this. Uh, and we're exceptionally proud of this in our exhibition on loan from our friends at the National Maritime Museum, who have done an amazing job at uh, preserving this garment and exactly to put on show here as it's, as it's seen. Uh, it's a very fine garment that he would have been proud of, uh, a sturdy woolen coat with brass buttons that would have kept him warm in winter and given him a sense of decency, belonging and identity 
uh, among his peers, the ranks of fellow ordinary seamen who had done their service and their national duty and were now going to be looked after. George's story of his own life ends there. He wrote the account of his life while he was a pensioner in Greenwich Hospital. But in the exhibition, if you come and see it, you'll be able to trace right through to the end what happened to George. He lived into a ripe old age and there are some surprising twists right at the end of his life uh, that I think you would enjoy if you come to see it. But he lived a long life and enjoyed a comfortable old age. And it's a story of a foundling of empire who ultimately, I think, found peace and a degree of comfort in telling his important story. Thanks for watching and I really hope you enjoy the exhibition.